Hi, I'm Dr. Major Vimal Raj. I'm a consultant cardiothoracic radiologist heading the unit of cardiothoracic imaging in Narayana Hridayalaya, Bangalore. Today, I'm going to be talking about imaging of ILDs raising the bar for radiologists. What is expected of a radiologist? Now, this is very, very important in today's world where the margins of uh, speciality are not as strong as what they were before. Some of the pulmonologists are much better than some of the radiologists in interpreting some of the HRCT scans for interstitial lung disease. Similarly, some of the neurosurgeons are better than some of the junior radiologists in interpreting spine or MRI brain. For a radiologist, it is very, very important that we get the best quality of scan to begin with. If you don't get good quality of scan, you're not going to get a good report out of that study. Next, a radiologist should be able to provide a diagnosis in a correct fashion, consistently, and has to concur with his own opinion as well as the opinion of his peers to make that report more believable and make it more robust. Also, it is very important for a radiologist or even a pulmonologist to look at the HRCT scans and try to get information regarding prognosis of the patient rather than simple diagnosis. Finally, a radiologist plays a very important role in the MDD. Now, I may keep saying radiologist in this context, but the matter is that any person who is interpreting an image for HRCT in patients suspected with interstitial lung disease, all the parameters that I'm going to be talking about are important and are areas where everyone can improve. Because at the end of the day, it is the care of the patient that needs to be best and whoever is providing that best care will do really well. When it comes to quality of scan, truly very little importance is given to it in a lot of units. The scanner parameters are important. A multi-detector CT like a 64 slice CT is certainly going to be better than a 8 slice CT or a 16 slice CT because the breath hold time required in a 64 or a higher end slice scanner is going to be very minimal. So patients who have advanced fibrotic lung disease can get a better scan quality because of the shorter breath hold duration. The quality of the images may not vary between a 16 slice or a 64 slice CT scanner. Thin section images are essential and similarly imaging in inspiration has to be of very good quality. Most of these patients will also require expiratory scan imaging to look for areas of air trapping. Prone imaging is reserved for people who have basal changes which may be dependent in nature. Finally, how you review images also make a difference. Gone are the days where viewing these images on a film was sufficient. I would never advise anybody to do that anymore because you should insist on getting a 3D data set which is in a CD form so you can load it in your computer and see the entire data set to get to good diagnosis. To just get your concepts clear, this is what used to happen. This was HRCT cuts where imaging was performed at one slice, one millimeter slice thickness with 10 millimeter gap and then we used to do uh, gap, gap, gap and scan. I would not advise this anymore and I would suggest everyone to have an entire scan of the chest as a 3D volumetric data to get the best outcome. Also. Every scan which is done can be converted into high resolution images. What you can see here, this is the same patient, same scan, normal resolution image and a high resolution image. When you see the clarity of your high resolution image, you can clearly understand that it will be very easy to pick pathologies and make diagnosis on high resolution images. Similarly, inspiration versus expiration makes a huge difference because sometimes if your technician hasn't asked the patient to hold their breath very well and you got this scan and you did not recognize that this was an expiratory scan, you may end up calling all these areas as ground glass. But in reality, 
this patient's lung on inspiratory scan is absolutely normal and what we are seeing are patchy areas of air trapping on expiratory scan. So make sure you get inspiratory and expiratory scan in your patients with suspected interstitial lung disease. Similarly, supine imaging may show some changes in the lung basis which could represent early interstitial lung disease. When you put them in a prone position, you can see the area getting cleared, suggestive of a dependent change rather than true interstitial lung disease. Coming to diagnosis, there are changing times in ILD management, especially the nomenclature of interstitial lung disease and how we classify them is changing. This was the standard classification which came out in year 2013 where we divided interstitial lung disease into chronic fibrosing interstitial pneumonias, then into subacute or acute interstitial pneumonias and smoking related interstitial lung disease. Now it is useful to differentiate interstitial lung disease into a fibrosing variety or a non-fibrosing variety. Fibrosing varieties are those where you can see traction dilatation of bronchi architectural distortion, loss of volume, and these progress over a period of time. These are different types of bronchiectasis that you can see where the bronchi is dilated and there is non-trapering of bronchi as we go towards the periphery of the lung. It is also important to know that towards the periphery of the lung, around 2 centimeters of the lung, you should not be seeing any bronchi there. If you start seeing bronchi there, then it is suggestive of uh, bronchiectasis. This is uh, an example where you can see reticular changes in the subpleural aspect of the lung, attraction dilatation of bronchi, suggestive of a fibrosing interstitial lung disease. This on the other hand is a simple bronchiectasis in the central aspect of the lung without any fibrotic changes. So differentiating between a simple bronchiectasis and that of a traction bronchiectasis is secondary to fibrosis is important in classifying fibrosing interstitial pneumonias. This is another statement which came out in year 2018 where we started looking at every case of fibrosing interstitial lung disease into four categories. One, UIP, where you start to seeing honeycombing, peripheral traction dilatation of bronchi, you're starting to see apicobasal gradient, and absence of non-specific features of UIP. The same pattern without honeycombing was that of probable UIP. But if you start seeing a lot of ground glass opacity, a lot of nodules, a lot of air trapping or central disease, then we start thinking about an alternative diagnosis. Let's look at some examples. Here is an example of a typical UIP pattern where you're seeing subpleural disease you're seeing honeycombing, you're seeing an apicobasal gradient with not much of ground glass opacity. On the other hand, this is a patient with very similar features, but there is no honeycombing in the lung basis in keeping with a probable UIP. A third patient where you can see there are subpleural reticular changes, but there are patchy areas of ground glass opacities, not too much of traction dilatation of bronchi, not too much of any honeycombing at all in this patient, although some apicobasal gradient is present. So this is indeterminate in nature, especially for UIP. So you would call it as indeterminate for UIP. The alternative diagnosis are cases where you're seeing extensive air trapping, lots of ground glass opacities or central involvement. As you can see in this case, ground glass with central involvement in patients with NSIP or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. What is important is for everybody to now start looking at HRCT scans for interstitial lung disease and first and foremost decide is it a fibrosing variety or a non-fibrosing variety. And once you have decided that this is a fibrosing variety, then you need to classify it as typical for UIP, probable UIP, indeterminate for UIP or inconsistent with UIP. I think if you are able to put them into this larger broader category then you have done most of your job because you can then discuss as part of a team and come to a final diagnosis. 
there are two three scenarios where you all need to be a little bit careful about in interstitial lung disease one such scenario is when you start seeing bronchocentric involvement of uh, lung disease patchy areas of ground glass opacities think in terms of organizing pneumonia especially as part of NSIP when you start to see this subpleural sparing of the lung parenchyma. These are some pointers which will help you in honing down your diagnosis. Another such scenario is when you start to see extensive honeycombing okay, and you start to see a, what is called as a straight edge sign, abnormal lung parenchyma and suddenly everything else is normal about that. So this is called as a straight edge sign. This is called as a exuberant honeycombing. And then one more feature, if you look on the anterior aspect of the upper lobes bilaterally, and if you're seeing some areas of honeycombing in these areas, then it is called as a four corner sign. So one corner, two corner, and then three and four corners towards the lung basis. These features put together are suggestive of a UIP pattern but underlying connective tissue disease. So whenever you see this, think and investigate for connective tissue disease. Coming to hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, with new recent guidelines coming out, uh, we have to start using terminologies as fibrosing hypersensitivity pneumonitis against non-fibrosing hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So central involvement, reticular changes, air trapping, are features which suggest a hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Especially if you start to see architectural distortion, think about fibrosing hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Another feature to look at all your interstitial lung disease, uh, whenever I teach uh, my students, my colleagues, uh, we always insist on looking at the pulmonary artery. A pulmonary artery which is dilated in relation to the iota suggests underlying pulmonary hypertension which could be secondary to pulmonary fibrosis, but could also be a part of connective tissue disease, especially if you start to see a dilated esophagus or you start to see lots of ground glass opacities in the lung parenchyma. So this is a patient of connective tissue disease with pulmonary hypertension. Let us look at this very interesting case. This is a patient who presented very early and you can see some patchy areas of subpleural involvement not very suspect not very consistent with any pattern i would have called it as indeterminate for uip at that stage and then you look at the progression of this and now you're seeing areas of honeycombing after some period of time in the same patient so it becomes very difficult to maintain that consistency where you call this as indeterminate for uip now perhaps it is looking a little bit more like UIP, but there is still some ground glass opacities. Further follow-up of this patient at a slightly different level, now you're seeing more central disease with subpleural sparing in there. Now this is not typical for UIP. This is more in keeping with inconsistent with UIP, a connective tissue disease kind of a picture. Final follow-up of this patient, now you're seeing extensive honeycombing in a UIP pattern in this patient. The important point here becomes is depending on which part of the uh, clinical uh, period do we do the scan, we may be getting an answer at a different pattern of lung disease. So consistency becomes difficult and this is clearly shown in evidence where we amongst radiologists, be juniors versus clinical uh, clinicians versus senior radiologist, the inter-observer agreement is extremely poor in patients with interstitial lung disease. So maintaining a consistency is a challenge for everybody. It is something that we need to strive on and make sure you compare with the prior imaging to get an idea of what is really happening. The next important point for every clinician or radiologist is to get prognostically important data in the HRCT studies that we do. The pattern of lung involvement, whether it is reticulation, honeycombing or ground glass is important. 
the distribution or the amount of lung involvement is also very very important and you can see there is significant differences in survival of patient depending on the total lung parenchymal involvement with fibrosis with people having less fibrosis tending to do better compared to the ones who have high fibrosis calculation of these uh, pulmonary fibrosis is not very easy there is one software which is done really well called as the caliper software which is able to quantify using artificial intelligence every hrct into different patterns and come up with amount of ground glass amount of honeycombing and amount of reticular changes apart from giving a percentage of lung fibrosis it is also able to provide a value called as pvrs pulmonary vascular related substances this is an arbitrary value which they stumbled upon in their research work and what they have seen is this correlates with the amount of interstitial vasculature which is available it is a very useful value and i will tell you how it helps in prognosis in a second in india uh, we do have a alternative to caliper which is called as the credible health i do have a conflict of interest i'm one of their advisors so please uh, take it with a pinch of salt of what i tell uh, this is a artificial intelligence based software which is able to detect lung cancer nodules it is able to quantify emphysema it is able to quantify covid and again now uh, we are able to quantify the degree of fibrosis and the pattern of fibrosis which can be used for prognostication of patients with fibrosing interstitial lung disease. If you look at the prognosis, UIP pattern in itself and honeycombing is a poor prognostic feature irrespective of what kind of disease people have. So if you have a UIP or if you have a honeycombing, then it is poor prognosis. Reticular pattern of disease has got poor prognosis in patients with fibrosing hypersensitivity pneumonitis compared to ground glass pattern. Amongst all of these patterns, it is important that when you look at the lung parenchyma involvement, there are some predictors which will tell us that these patients are likely to have slower progression and will have better survival prospects. One of that is a total fibrosis score of less than 20% gets you a good prognosis, especially in people who have IPF. So a total fibrosis score of 20% is a cutoff mark that you need to be looking at. Also, patients who have a PVRS of more than 5% have got poor prognosis. So total fibrosis score and PVRS are two parameters that I would like you all to remember going forward. One of the common issues that we all face is the quality of reporting of HRCT is variable in different parts of the country, in different parts of the world. Some people are extremely good at it, while some people are not so good at it. So this has led to some uh, suggestions of standardizing some reporting templates, which basically talk about every possibility and people just have to say, yes or no and then talk about the axial distribution talk about the zonal distribution talk about the progression of the disease and then come up with the score of ild rads which is 0 1 2 3 4 which corresponds to ild rads 1 is typical uip 2 is probable uip 3 is indeterminate for uip and 4 is alternative diagnosis or inconsistent with UIP. Finally, the role of the radiologist or clinician who is involved in ILD management is about MDT or MDD discussions where it is a teamwork and working alone is not going to be useful. So to summarize, uh, I think we need to subspecialize. We need to develop people who have got special interest in interstitial lung disease special interest in thoracic imaging and we should groom these talents so that it improves the overall uh, accuracy of our reports and improves the way we start treating our patients. It is also important to standardize the reporting and the nomenclature that we use. Start looking for prognostic features. So honeycombing, 
if you see reticulation being more in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, if the fibrosis score is more than 20% or if the PVRS is more than 5%, all these parameters are suggestive of poor prognosis of these patients. And finally, MDT discussions are very, very important uh, for you all to learn from each other and improve your diagnostic skills. Thank you very much for listening in and uh, if you're interested in learning more on ILD and HRCTs, please do visit to my YouTube channel where you will find a lot of more interesting talks all for free and uh, if you have any doubts, more than happy to answer them at the end of the session. Thank you.